coming up on Theater Talk. But I think that what has happened, and this may be the tipping point this year, is that the New York critics have lost a lot of power. Absolutely. In turn. Bye, Jesse Green. <laughs> All right. <laughs> go, go, go. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and Paul Bungert and Alan Lane. Settle down, settle down, calm down. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, what do we have today? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Romper Room. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you're in Captain Kangaroo. What is wrong with what, what so, what, Michael, what are we having today? Senor <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we going to do it's, today? It's called Theater Talk. Yeah. We are looking ahead, as the adults that we are, to the upcoming <laughs> Broadway and off-Broadway season here in New York. And we are joined by our regular romper rumors, <laughs> Patrick Pacheco of New York One on Stage and the Los Angeles Times. Michael Musto, who's dressing like Alan Carr these days. God, the last time I saw somebody wearing a caftan, it was Rosie Clooney at Rainbow and Stars. This was actually a sale from the last ship. This was the entire budget for the show. <laughs> uh, Michael Musto from the New York out, Times. Out.com and, out and papermag.com. And papermag.com. Welcome to Theater Talk and our friend Jesse Green from New York Magazine, the only man who really qualifies as a proper critic on this panel. I do I, I've never been called a proper critic. <laughs> <laughs> Just a mean, nasty, horrible... There well, we you, go. Well, you actually, you're not a, you're not a, you're not a mean critic. People like you. They actually do like you. People in the future really? tell me they like you. Really? Yeah. Oh. But you tell it like it is. I must be doing it wrong. <laughs> I know, I know. you got to get the knife out this okay. time and stick it in. That's my New Year's resolution. And I think there are plenty of juicy targets headed our way this season for you to uh, slice and dice. Uh, let's start with one that I actually am kind of rooting for because I feel it's the underdog of the season. It's Honeymoon in Vegas. When you say Vegas. Vegas. You're saying love. Which has a friend of mine, Tony Danza, in it, and he gives a terrific performance. Uh, it also has a terrific performance by Rob McClure, yeah, who yeah. was Tony nominated for Chaplin. And it's got music by Jason Robert Brown, <clears throat> which is excellent. And it will have opened by it will the time have this airs, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And we'll see what the verdict of the critics do. But I think that what has happened, and this may be the tipping point this year, is that the New York critics have lost a lot of power. Absolutely. In turn. Bye, Jesse Green. <laughs> All right. Go, go, go. Go. <laughs> well, this is a good Thank point. God I'm not a proper critic. <laughs> I'd but be out of a job. But this is a very good point that Patrick brings up. I mean, if you look at this season, Sideshow got rave reviews closed at a monumental loss. St uh, Sting's musical, The Last Ship, got nice reviews. Nobody went to see it. Honeymoon in Vegas, the critics liked. No one's going to see on it. The town, have the, on the town? On the town. Have the critics been emasculated finally? Michael? Yes. Even the Times can't create a hit anymore. Sideshow, oh my gosh, this is the second coming of Christ. And people said, a musical about Siamese twins? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, Honeymoon in Vegas does fit the formula of what has been a successful type of show, which is take a middle brow, likable, not overly huge movie, yeah. like a Kinky Boots, a Newsies, yeah. and musicalize it without stars, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe make them stars. We'll see uh, what the reviewers say. Hello. <laughs> but apparently it doesn't matter. Do you, feel, do you feel totally emasculated now? Do you feel that you have a job? Well, but I have felt that way for <laughs> well over 50 years. So. <laughs> I mean, does it bother you? that I think it's any horrible that audiences are thinking for themselves. <laughs> this is terrible. They can't be dictated to anymore. How oh, no, no, this? no. They're, they're, they're thinking for themselves, but also they're being thought to by uh, marketing. I mean, the marketing for certain things is reaching them more strongly. Well, I more think Jeffrey made a very good point, and that was... Did I? Uh, yes. Did you call him Jeffrey? <laughs> <laughs> That's my alter ego. <laughs> The critics are, the critics are, are, are they don't even know are, the critics, they don't even know their names, they don't even know their names the anymore, so, <laughs> they're so obsolete, no, leave that so irrelevant, in. nobody can remember their, Jeffrey Green of, uh, Joanne Vincentelli, <laughs> and, you know, and, and Ben Grant, Freddie Isherwood, <laughs> but I really want to put you on the spot though, do you feel that you're writing for an audience that is no longer there, and that no one's paying attention to what you're saying, you I, no I feel that uh, I'm writing, and all critics are writing more and more for a fractionalized audience, that is, People who might be interested in this show will read about this show, but I think the general readerships, pe people who will read every review of every kind of show, I think that's what's being lost. So I think we do make a difference at the margins. Uh, people are interested in a serious drama. They hear of this one, they then a review that's very positive may make Send them go them. to it. But if, but for the 
to get the kinds of numbers that you need to make a hit out of a show that costs $16 million to put on, I don't think the critics can do much either way anymore. It's, it's about marketing. I think the critics did come through on A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. I think without and the, Tony the approbation, oh, yeah. the approba without the approbation of the critics, I'm not sure The Gentleman's Guide would have lasted to the Tonys in order to win the Tony in order to, to become the hit that it now is. So I think they can still make a difference and they can, I think especially are influential when it comes to Tony nominators. I think the Tony nominators still take their leads from what uh, Jesse Greenfield says. No, Jeffrey. Says I, Jeffrey. <laughs> they don't listen to me. But, not to roll backwards, but A Gentleman's <clears throat> Guide, as we remember, was the only musical that wasn't, you know, uh, some kind of pastiche, or uh, it was the only original, original, original musical. This is yeah. a great spring preview, by the yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> spring 2014. <laughs> Looking back and forward. Um, all right, well, let's move on to. Um, some of the other exciting new things that are headed our way. Well, what are we, Michael? You, you're, 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 you're an old queen, to? so are you going to respond to the <laughs> audience, right? That's the, oh, uh, I'm an old princess. <laughs> uh, am That's I the why, what was the question? <laughs> the audience, Helen Mirren playing Queen Elizabeth II. We're oh, looking forward to that, are we not? Well, she's got the Tony in the bag, even if it doesn't even show up on Broadway. But uh, apparently, this is a play where she reprises her role of Elizabeth from the movie, and it right. could be a rare chance for someone to get an Oscar and a Tony for the, for same, the same role play. in yeah. a different project. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And in the play, Queen Elizabeth is interviewing the various prime ministers through the years. So we see, I guess, Winston Churchill and a lot of other people you never heard of. Yeah. yeah. And people are already saying that could be a problem. Maybe they should rewrite it, make it like. LBJ, get Brian Cranston. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Sinkin. Frank Langella as Nixon. <laughs> Forget about Harold McMillan and, and the rest of them. And have a guest star like Vanessa Williams, like After Midnight did. You know, just come out and sing Stormy Weather. That's right. It's not really a problem, though. I mean, uh, people may not know who Harold uh, Wilson was, all right, but all you have to do is say Prime Minister Harold Wilson on some super title. He comes in and she has. They don't even need to say that. They just need to say Helen Mirren. Well, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but the thing, I think what they should do is they should dedicate an entire theater to these British imports. Just call it the Prestige Theater or something like that. The National Theater of New York. Of New York, but, you know, of London in New York, and put Wolf Hall in there. Or just call it Wolf Hall. <laughs> call Wolf Hall <laughs> and put the Queen in there. There's possible uh, King Charles III. But and I don't know. Skylight. And Skylight all, and, <clears throat> and be done with it because that's one way the critics have been circumvented. It, it really doesn't matter very much what we have to say about those shows. If people feel that they need their dose of prestige that season, they'll go to one of those shows. Why is it, Patrick, that these uh, these British shows come in with sort of the, I don't know, the, the Downton Abbey aura, that somehow they're considered uh, higher, uh, more sophisticated than the American plays that we get? I suppose, maybe it goes back to the colonies. Maybe we just have this uh, Anglophilia. Maybe Anglophilia is connected to it. But they've also had a chance to be polished, and the National Theater is such a crack outfit yeah. they that do a they good job. are, These are able good productions on the whole. Yes. Yeah, yeah they, they're able to develop it. They have the money, they have the resources to develop these shows very carefully all along the way, which perhaps we don't have as much as Lincoln Center or the Roundabout or other ones. So they come in very polished, and they've already been sort of endorsed by the London critics as well. Curious Incident came. You know, with huge expectations, they met them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, they do get. come, like Democracy or other plays that did come from London, because of the change in cast, perhaps, or other reasons, and they flopped. Patrick, have the London critics replaced the New York critics? No, uh, no, I, I no, don't the think so. Are, <clears throat> no. really. I'd like you to meet my other <laughs> alter ego, Joffrey. <laughs> <laughs> Joffrey Green, G-R-E-N-E. -E. Yeah. But, but the one thing, though, I think these, these, the playwrights and the directors are doing in England that we're not really doing here, and what I admire about some of these plays, like The Audience and like King Charles III, which I saw in London recently, and a play called Great Britain, which was about the News Corp phone hacking scandal, these plays are dealing with the political structures of their time. We don't mm -hmm. seem to have many American playwrights who are dealing with what's going on in the political realm today. Do we have evidence that if we had those playwrights, people would come to see their plays? Yes, that's the point. Well, we had the, L the LBJ play was, was, was popular. And 30 yeah. years after. Yeah. I but, Michael, you, you, you go off to London and have a fabulous time and go to all those, more, go to more plays in London than you were willing to go to better. in New York. They're better there. But we, we don't, they're better. the point they're, is. They're interesting plays. They're dealing with politics. But I think what you're so much in, interesting stuff no, happening in New York it. that we're not seeing. There's a lot of crap in London. I've gone to London. There's stuff <laughs> like Daisy takes it off and not with my wife, you know. <laughs> we only, we only run, get, run for your wife. Don't forget your trousers. <laughs> Brilliant. No, that was good. <laughs> but we're only getting the cream of the crop of London, and mm -hmm. we're getting everything of New York. Yes. In London, conversely, they're getting the best of Broadway. 
they're not seeing Wedding Singer or whatever some of the other crap is. Well, they do have Memphis running in London now, believe me. Well, that defies all the odds. And I had Octar did come up with Disgraced. Did it do well? I don't think it recouped, but it was very much of the moment. And in fact, play about as, Muslim totally. America. It's, it couldn't be more timely. And in fact, it seems to me that the the, the response to the play in many ways has changed as the headlines that changed. Uh, all yeah. right. So moving on to some of the other shows coming up. Um, Fish in the Dark. Larry David, uh, infinitely famous. From That's you, Jackman in the River. Fish in the Dark. No. <laughs> oh. uh, what do we know about Fish in the Dark? Not very much. I, to my knowledge, the script isn't out. I've, I've not had a chance to read it. It's a Scott Rudin production, which means she'll keep everything secretive and then. Well, it's probably a good plan for this show because yeah. the whole, the whole <clears throat> idea of it is Larry David. He hasn't d ever even written a poem, let alone a play. I mean, I don't think he has done anything on stage since he was, you know, five Struggling years actor. old. No, no. When he was, when he was, when he was a young aspiring actor, I remember him around at auditions. He okay, let me around. take all of that back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I th um, <clears throat> let's see. His career um, went somewhere, Susan. Well, as a writer, yes. And then I just love that you think Scott that. Rudin can keep anything secretive since his entire email collection has been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> but there was nothing in there about fish in the dark. Yeah, well, <laughs> you haven't read it yet. Not even a mention. <laughs> uh, I think they're kind of going for the sleeper North comedy Korea hit mm -hmm. yeah. slot. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. as this new musical, uh, Something Rotten, which has lately been announced, is going for this sort of sleeper musical slot, hoping to right. uh, surprise everybody, not overbuild the hype too far in advance and let too much out of And they are brave with a title like that. Yeah, they're really asking the critics. What is all, something? What is it? What is something it's, rotten? It's like Pippin meets Spamalot meets. Yeah, what's it's a new TV the, show, Gallivant. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the year is 1590, and this right. brother playwriting team are competing with a bard who's being played by Christian Borle. I think Brian Darcy James plays one of the brothers. And they're competing with the bard and trying to come up with something that will compete with him and come up with the, invent the Broadway musical. They invent music and singing and dancing. The big name, and I think the only reason it bypassed their pre-Broadway -tri uh, tryout in Seattle is because Casey Nicola yes. is directing right. and choreographing, and he's the golden boy at the moment with Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon and, and Aladdin. Aladdin, two of the biggest hits on Broadway. Yeah. And it was well received, and I <sighs> think people are starting to realize the best musical Tony battle will be between Something Rotten and Fun Home, which is a more earnest show about a lesbian and her closeted father. Oh, that again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is great. It's really a good show. Did you, but did you, you like Fun Home? Uh, I loved Fun Home. And yeah. what did the critics say about Fun Home? Uh, it was on most people's top Ecstatic. 10 list, if you not liked, very, I liked it. Yeah, but I bet, I bet it opens with a zero in the, in the bank. I bet nobody cares. Well, it's kind of got the Carolina change spot. You mm -hmm. know, it yeah. started at the public, revered. <laughs> and then dies on Broadway. The, well, I hope not, but it, it is a tough sell. And it is very earnest. Well, earnest makes it sound like it's dull or too good for it to be fun. It's, that was the last ship. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, it's really, uh, it's uh, wonderfully emotional and funny even. <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't like to use the word earnest, but it does have a, quite a path ahead of it. I actually like The Last Ship, but I really think they should have spent some money on building a freaking ship. <laughs> uh, give the tourists a destination, a reason to see the show. That when they built the ship at the end, it was all done with lighting and wood and kind of <laughs> suggestion. Yeah. That was one problem. Um, here, now, here's a play. I'd be curious to know if it holds up. I remember seeing it uh, back in the day, in the 80s, and it was very effective. Uh, I think one of the Pulitzer Prize, The Heidi Chronicles by Wendy Wasserstein, about a woman who decides to have a baby by herself, which in the 80s was a big thing. Uh, have you looked at that play? Have you thought about that play? Is it sort of past its sell-by date, as the British say, Patrick? Not since I saw it, but they have a very good director in Pam McKinnon. Uh, and I think she's going to bring a lot to it. They also have, I think, Elizabeth Moss Who's and playing? Jason Biggs. And Bryce Pinkham. And Bryce Pinkham, mm -hmm. yeah. Pinkham. <laughs> I've got to get the names right. Um, Jesse so, Green. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I'm very curious to see it, especially, you know, obviously it was by the late Wendy Wasserstein, and as you pointed out, it's her Pulitzer Prize winner. Yeah. And it's very autobiographical. Ironically, she did end up adopting Adopt the, yeah. a child. No, uh, no, she didn't adopt. She, or she, somebody had yes, the child that's for right. her. That's right. Uh, what do you think about this play? Does it still hold up? Do we still want it's a, it's a, a woman talky, who goes out on her own? It's a talk. I actually like Sisters Rosenzweig better as yeah, far as the play. Wasserstein play, but it is a very good, very strong play. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I have so little to say about it. I just, <laughs> <laughs> is, this one, <laughs> is this one you're looking forward to weighing in on, Jesse? I, I am, but not for issues that would be of interest to anyone else. I mean, as a, oh. cri as a critical problem, it's interesting. Why? Well, weather plays from that moment, right. which mostly have not fared well. Yeah. Uh, you know, weather, 
uh, some of the best of that time do hold up or not, particularly for the reason you suggested, because the issues that it deals with seem to be really rooted in that moment and are not really the same anymore. So it'll, it'll be the first time we get to see whether that material uh, can really transcend its time or not. Mm. So in that sense, I'm, I'm very interested. So what's the story on Dr. Zhivago? It's been... It's, it's been a long time uh, coming. It's been, it's been, wait, is that, is that, is that Rebecca? <laughs> it's also like Rebecca it's, it's Lucy Simon. Lucy Simon. Uh, now, I must say, I, like, I loved Lucy Simon's score to The mm. Secret Garden years and years ago. And I have not heard the score, but I do hear there's some very beautiful ballads, and they're using the theme from... Laura. Laura. Laura's theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it. I saw Please, it. Okay. Well, I saw it in 2006. Uh, quite a long time ago. And it's been in development for about good. 10 years. And that's always a really good sign. I, <laughs> uh, I liked it. I, it was at La Jolla Playhouse, directed by Des Mackinac. Right, he's still with it. And he's still with it. Oh, well, and then it was director. more recently produced in Australia and got very, very... Hey, good that's also a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> and also now that in Russia they kind of imprison gays on sight, it's a great time to celebrate Russia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure that it celebrates Russia. Oh, no, Russia. it doesn't Somewhere celebrate Russia. Oh, okay, good. Love, uh, there will be but it's got it's, a lot of the elements that go into the Broadway hours long like the movie <laughs> uh, but you know it took Boris Matt Pasternak I hope I got that name right uh, 10 years to write it so why not a musical 10, 20 10 years, years to come to Broadway. but you, but you actually saw it and you liked it I liked it it was the first musical I ever saw that started with a woman coming into a party and shooting her ex-lover who raped her <laughs> well that's the Heidi Chronicles <laughs> no, no. So, so does that does that open <laughs> grab you Michael I want the prequel. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, a. It does come. It no, does that, But that, I didn't know that, and that's, that that show, that again speaks to the very smart Des Machina. When you think of, for instance, how he begins Jersey Boys, such a hit with being in a modern disco and and going back. I mean, he's such a shrewd storyteller. So that that gives me optimism about Dr. It just Chicago. this was another one though that sounds to me that could open with zero in the in the bank and just nobody's gonna yes. nobody's gonna care. Well, yes, you just have to see how it. It's got a title, a good title. I think most people remember it, the, the Julie Christie, well, Omar Sharif, the, David Lean film. The, most age. people know, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> All right, but, I, but they also study they go the to novel. Most people go to Broadway. Hey, what's the heart of Robin Hood? <laughs> <laughs> it's a change of subject. <laughs> Oh, forget that, Susan. <laughs> there is a play, though, that I really am looking forward to. That I, it's an older play, but I do think it holds mm. up well, and that's David Hare's Skylight. Mm. A it's a really beautiful play. It's his most human play, I think, in some ways. It's, it is beautiful, and it has the imprimatur of having been a much acclaimed hit in London. And, and I, Bill Nye, who's And Bill Nye, popular. and um, Carrie Mulligan, Harry Mulligan, yeah, Carrie Mulligan, who uh, is marvelous on stage. So it has all the markings of Masterpiece Theater on Broadway live. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll play at Wolf Hall. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and it's directed by Stephen Daldry, who has two shows this spring, both The Audience and Skylight. And we should also point out that Cheetah Rivera is coming back to Broadway in uh, Cantor and Ebb's last show. There were a lot of Cantor and Ebb shows that were billed <laughs> as the true. last show. But this is the last one that John wrote with Fred Ebb before he And when that was announced, the gunshot you heard was Kelly O'Hara. Well, there's, oh, a, there's, <laughs> there's a big diva off uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, oh, well, so who are they? Totally. Well, we, you have uh, now Cheetah Rivera. In The Visit. In mm -hmm. The Visit. You have Kelly O'Hara in The Revival of the King, the King and I. I. Everyone has felt, okay, finally it's You've Kelly's, got Tony Danza in Honeymoon <laughs> Advance. <laughs> yes, he's going to put on a wig and go for Best Actress. <laughs> right. uh, Kristen Chenoweth in The Revival of uh, the King uh, and the I. On the 20th century. century. You have the, an actual diva, Renee Fleming, right, uh, who's right. appearing in a play That's called a Living That's a great play. And then you have the two uh, conjoined twins who should get nominated for Sideshow, I think. Or together or separately? I don't know. <laughs> they do, they do separation surgery on their nomination? But, you know, The Visit, though, uh, have you seen it? Did you see I it? I did. I saw it at Williamstown. And how was it? I thought that it was... She's brilliant. She's absolutely... It's an extraordinary role. Didn't you uh, write a show for her once? <laughs> I didn't write the show. Terrence McNally wrote the show. Well, you worked I, on I had the pleasure. Disclosure. I had the pleasure of uh, doing the interview. But it's her. not a role that we think that we identify <clears throat> Cheetah Rivera with. I mean, she, we identify her with, with uh, happy musical comedies. And what is one, the role? She plays yes. a, a, a woman who goes back to get revenge on the man who jilted her. She wants the town to well, kill him. Well, she won the Tony for The Rink and for Kiss of the Spider Woman. She's done very dark music. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Totally. By the way, this show uh, was supposed to come to Broadway in 2001 with Angela Lansbury and then her husband died and she backed out and then it took a long road back sadly long after Fred Ebb died in 2004 it's yeah. a radically different work than it was uh, in 2001 I've heard the score it's a very good score it is very, very good, good very very did you good see score. it yes mm. it did. did you well, like it I can't say you'll have to <laughs> it doesn't ask, matter anyway you'll have to ask Joffrey <laughs> 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 so, so 
we don't have much time left, and I'm really interested in what you're most enthusiastic about. Uh, we haven't talked about Off Broadway, and right. I'm very eager to see Hamilton, the mm. new Lin Manuel Miranda musical at the Public Theater. He did In the Heights, which was popular. Um, and uh, the flick, which was one of my favorite plays of the last few years and won the Pulitzer Prize, is returning Off Broadway. Um, you know, sure to cause dissension among audiences. It's a what's it about? Well, it's a long play in which nothing very much happens. <laughs> so it's right up your alley. Yeah. Uh, and the critics are irrelevant <laughs> because they, they because we like long plays in which nothing, nothing happens. happens. <laughs> um, so th those are two things that I'm particularly looking forward to off Broadway. I guess hand to God because there hasn't been a puppet show since Avenue <laughs> Q. Uh, an American in Paris because usually when they adapt fabulous movie musicals, they're terrible. Like the original Gigi on Broadway, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, Singing in the Rain. So you're looking so I want forward to, to that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I love, saw it I love a good bad show. over the holidays, I saw it. You and? Were, right, well what they're attempting to do, and we'll leave it to the critics to decide whether or not they have succeeded, <clears> is <throat> uh, combine classical ballet with old fashioned musical comedy. <laughs> and we had that in On the on Town. The town. <laughs> on the town. And Pat, Patrick, something that you're uh, looking uh, for? Wolf Hall, uh, yeah. which is the stage adaptation of the Hilary Mantel, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, <laughs> that, word, that last name correctly, uh, which is obviously about Eight hours Oliver, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, I think it's two and a half hours and two and a half hours. It's parts one and two, five hours altogether with a dinner break. And it's about Oliver Cromwell's uh, from low birth to high power in the court of Henry VIII. And so Jeffrey Richards sent out the invitation like three months ago, literally. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, saying, I know you're all going to be busy in April, so why don't you book it now? And I did, and now I can't remember what <laughs> date I are. <RSVP. laughs> and it also, um, and I think that um, I'm, just from a total story point of view in terms of how this all pans out, is Finding Neverland. I want to say, Harvey having Weinstein's seen it, first big Broadway show. Yeah, having seen it at ART, as you did as well, Michael, famously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays, how it changes from ART to Broadway, and how Harvey, who is determined to will it into a hit, whether he's successful or not. But yeah. did you like it at the ART on, uh, in Boston? I like the attention I got from having Harvey <laughs> just put a ice on my head with yes, an ice and he out. said he was the most popular man on Broadway. Yeah, well, uh, that's because uh, he promised that he would not have uh, premium prices. It's I asked because him. he dumped a bucket of, of ice, ice on, on my head. <laughs> head. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I am mystified by this infatuation with the whole Peter Pan thing. We just had NBC's <clears> Peter <throat> Pan, Finding Neverland. There are all these backstories of Peter Pan. Uh, Peter and the Starcatcher. Peter, yeah. And, yeah. To me, it's kind of worn itself out, I think. But they're, they're adding Kelsey Grammer. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not with audiences. Audiences keep tuning into these things. Well, they're, and there's a they're film running out of characters well. to exploit that could potentially attract a family audience, and that is one formula that continues to work on Broadway. Well, it's going to be mm -hmm. fascinating, though, is to watch, as Patrick points out, to watch Harvey bring to bear on Broadway the tactics that he has famously used mm -hmm. in the movie business like to, what? To, win, to win the Oscar. I mean, just unrelenting marketing campaign all the time. I mean, he, you know, he, he, he'll he get that, he got uh, a scene from Finding Neverland on the Tonys last Very year. Very true. Very you true. You know, and then they, they wouldn't let him go on NBC, the, uh, the uh, Macy's Day Parade, because they wanted to advertise their own NBC's Peter Pan. So he went right over to ABC and did, had them do a Finding Neverland thing <laughs> opposite the Macy's Day Parade. He will stop at nothing. Sounds like Scott Rudin. Yeah, well, that's going to be, I wish Scott Rudin had a musical this season, because it'd be kind of fun to see the two moguls go at it, Scott Rudin and, um, and Harvey Weinstein. But. Straight against gay, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the power of the producers is more interesting than the, the I material. I think this is, this is going to be a season, especially with somebody like Harvey Weinstein there, where the stuff behind the scenes is going to be more interesting for the most part than what... Well, in that scene from Finding Neverland was the incongruously dressed Jennifer Hudson, yeah, right. who you reported is now going to come to Broadway in the color purple, right? In the color purple, that's right, in the fall. Which, yeah. mm -hmm. another American Idol star, Fantasia, did brilliantly in that show, brilliant. actually. Fantasia was brilliant. And I think Clay Aiken should be next. <laughs> in the color I purple? <laughs> if you're sticking with American Idol. <laughs> I'm just looking for some scrappy little, you know, artistic venture where they've, some artist has written something with passion and then it's not been all Oh, up damn, now. a musical Get memoir by <laughs> Sam Harris. That's the one. I read Sam Harris's memoir, Ham. Uh, and it's it's charming, and he's done a one-man show about it, so it's it's, it's kind of fun. He's got like two performances in January. I don't think it's going to be a big <laughs> so deal. So Star Search and American Idol are taking over Broadway. There we go. All oh, right, Patrick Pacheco from uh, New York One on Stage and the L.A. Times. Michael Musto, from the caftan-clad Michael <laughs> Musto from uh, the New York Times, out and paper 
Paper dot, mache magazine. Paper.com. <laughs> I don't think the Times is going to like this outfit. <laughs> no. uh, and uh, Jeffrey, Je <laughs> Jesse Green <laughs> from New York Magazine. <laughs> A study uh, in irrelevancy. <laughs> bye, everybody. <laughs> bye. Vegas is, was, and always will be the hottest of all hot spots. There's some guy's been here 50 years and is still shoving things in slots. What is he talking about? When you say Vegas, Vegas. you're saying the sky's always blue. London's too old and Cleveland ain't pretty. And we got nicer hookers than Jersey City. There's a whole lot of love in Nevada just waiting for you. So come to Las Vegas. What I say, Las Vegas! Lead away, Las Vegas! The land where dreams come true. Come on, Las Vegas! Yeah! Our thanks to the friends at Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.